Well, we just heard a few excerpts from the book of Esther. One of the claims about the book of Esther that I often hear or read is that it's the only book in the Bible that does not mention God. And it's true that the word God is not mentioned, but the spark of God can be found in the characters. That's the point. God is in Mordecai. God is in Esther and their actions. But God is also in anyone who desires or acts toward the well-being of others, which in the story of times even includes the goofy king. But it, it also includes us, us as we respond with desires to the well-being of God's people in the story. It is the God spark within us at play. Esther fans the God spark in her into a flame in the last one, and of course in the rest of the book that bears her name. This fall, many of our lectionary readings lift up women and female aspects of God. A few weeks ago we heard about the Syrophoenician woman in Luke, and we also heard about God's female voice as wisdom in Proverbs. And today we're considering Esther, a young woman. And we will consider Ruth and Naomi and Hannah before Advent. And Advent, I usually preach on Mary, Jesus' mother, but I'm happy to report that Reverend Anna Wolfen and our new visiting pastor of peace and spirituality will preach on Mary as a part of Peace Sunday in December. And Anna, as I mentioned, is joining the church today. And I want to point out that you can join without preaching afterwards. So don't let that hold you back. Lots of powerful, important women are being lifted up in the days ahead, so stay tuned. And the decision to lift up women, including use of today's reading from Esther, was made when I first came back from medical week because there's this sense in modern churches that men are the primary actors in the Bible and the conduits of God work and the holders of God. Spark, but that is a patriarchal spirit that we've been challenging, at least since I arrived. And so I am very glad that, that the lectionary provides the opportunity to add more women in our continuing discussion about their equal value and the very important roles they play in the overarching story of the Bible and in doing God's work. And real in real life, of course, women have always been somewhere near to half the population. And while patriarchies have long denied women equal opportunities in the earthly power structures created by men, God has always provided women with equal opportunities to do the divine work of seeking justice and loving kindness and walking humbly with God. And it's half the population, women as a whole, have done more than their part in bringing love and justice and peace into the world. They have arguably brought about more saving acts for love and justice and peace than men have in many respects. And consequently, we do well to lift heroic women up and celebrate their accomplishments and emulate their devotion and courage. And so, let's look at Esther. This is a story that's not very well known by Christians, but it has for centuries and centuries been the central story of Purim, an annual Jewish holiday where Esther, a young woman, woman is held up and her story is retold with great celebration and meaning. In the story, Esther and Mordecai can be understood to represent age old literary character that we are now very familiar with, male and female heroes. And likewise, the king represents what we know as stock buffoon leader, and Haman is a stock, cold-hearted villain. And although modern Christians usually do not consider the literary nature of it or the humor in it, the story of Esther has long been understood 
understood by others since the start to have an intentional element of over-the-top comedy to it. It's farcical, even burlesque in nature. And I think of it like one of those Western melodramas with a goofy mayor and a boo, his mustache twirling bad guy, and a save the day cowgirl. Cowgirl. I do find it a bit sad that church tradition of late does not like to consider humor in our sacred texts. This is especially true of the book of Esther. Dr. Adele Berlin, a professor of Hebrew Bible at the University of Maryland, in her article, Esther as comedy and a book of the Bible being funny challenges that. She describes the story of Esther like this. The normally sedate affairs of state, the carefully organized and controlled government structure, the legal system, the efficient postal system, the impressive accumulation of wealth indicative of successful empire, all the achievements most praiseworthy in the Persian Empire are turned into a burlesque of Persian court life. Caricatured by ludicrous edicts, delivered by steam messengers, a foppish royal part and a court and an endless hierarchy of officials and a wooden adherence to nonsensical laws. A major policy decision. The annihilation of the Jews is made casually, but a small domestic incident, Vashti's non-appearance at a party, becomes a crisis of state with all the bureaucratic trappings that can be mustered. She goes on to know that the largest interpretive problems do not obey if the story is taken as a farce or a comedy associated with a carnival-like festival. When the book sets out a threat to the Jews so that the Jewish audience can watch with glee and laugh with relief as it is overcome. The mad and threatening world of the beginning of the story fades into a happy ending where for a brief moment the Jews their two representatives can play at wielding the highest power in the greatest empire to which they were in reality subservient and which they were an insignificant minority. The story, like its accompanying festival, does what comedy and carnival are supposed to do. It confirms the belief that the power at work in the universe favors life and favors the success of the Jews. The book of Esther affirms that all is right with the world with the place of the Jews in it. Those are the enlightening observations on the story that we are considering this morning by Professor Adele Berlin. The Jewish festival of Purim is a beloved holiday, and every single word of the story is read aloud to mellow, dramatic boos and hisses for the villain and costumes for the gathered, which is why I guess the old-fashioned melodrama stick in my mind. And the moral of the story plays out in commandments given during the holiday that everyone follows. One commandment, the most famous, is that participants are instructed to get so drunk that they cannot differentiate between blessed is Mordecai and blessed is Haman. Let go of hate. Forgive is the point. That's when shalom rolls in. And there are other commandments during the holiday, including one to provide food and gifts to others, and another to be charitable to everyone. We know that also our efforts toward shalom rolling in. The holiday of Purim grows out of the whole story found in Esther, which while having humorous context, is a profound story about how an alien Jewish female found a way to do God's work in the middle of a very oppressive foreign regime with terrible patriarchal treatment of women at the forum. The story is meant to mock the oppressive patriarchy and evil actors with humor, but the main thrust is finding a way to heroically do God's work from places we find ourselves in, even the darkest places. Esther is seemingly stuck in her role as a piece of property owned by an abusive and goofy king and at the mercy of the king's very dysfunctional leadership headed by a dastardly arch-villain Haman. And in all of that, Esther 
master heroically finds a way to not just seek, but to achieve justice. To not just love kindness, but provide kindness. To not just be humble, but to walk along God's side, being so. The master of is not alone in doing God's work. Mordecai works the system from his inn as an oppressed foreigner male, while she works at front at it from her end as an even more oppressed foreigner female. Now, we do not need to hear God actually refer to by name or label in the story because Esther and Mordecai personify God at work. To borrow from Genesis, the image of God is made in them, male and female. And sure enough, when we hear or read the story, we Presume God's presence in the people and in the positive outcomes that unfold because of them and God's presence. And God's presence is found either calling humans toward or away from actions and inactions. And it's not hard to figure out which way God is calling. It's toward the well-being of God's people. And so the heroes Esther and Mordecai are cheered. The over-the-top villain and bumbling king are booed and laughed at. An underpinning story is not actually funny at all, especially in light of the Holocaust, the more recent rise of white power, and Nazi white groups that marches in our own country. Anti-Semitism has been around a long, long time, and it in this very old story haunting us. And that haunting is our God spark calling us away from hate and oppression of others and toward desiring and acting for their well-being. I wrote this sermon more than two weeks ago, which is my habit, but yesterday after prayerfully and carefully considering things and even into this morning, I've added and changed the ending. It's, it's obvious that the underpinning oppression of women, Esther, and others in the story is also not funny. And that is especially so this week. When a woman through the thoughtless machinations of incredibly divisive politics on both sides of the aisle was placed before the world to painfully describe teenage boys, whoever we may believe they were or were not, that they were raised in such a way that they laughed while horrendously threatening her 15-year-old body and her life. And the culture provided no place that seems safe for her to tell someone even now. More than three decades later, her story, and that story as she told it Thursday, made me weep. Many women do not feel there is a safe place to speak of their experiences of abuse. And if you are such a person, I will do my best to provide or find you a safe, safe place if you let me know or your shepherd will. Or if you can't let us know, please call someone. New Directions is one place. The result of the past few days is that we find that the Dr. Christine Lazy Ford story haunts and that haunting is also the God's part, calling us away from paint and oppression of others and toward desiring the well-being of others, most especially girls and women in our culture who are exposed daily to the threat of violence. That event that is still unfolding has had terrible negative implications, and there appear to still be thoughtless machinations at play on both sides. But I want to point out that this week, the God Spark call seems to have been experienced, at least heard, by almost all people on both sides. 
Often the awful political wrangling is the fact that there has been a glimmer of light in the united expression of concern by most Americans left, right, and in the middle for the well-being of Dr. Ford. And for women and girls exposed to such abuse. The gut spark at week at work in, in Aspen is at work in the real life story of America. And while we may want to caricature people or other political persuasions as one-dimensional demons, almost all the political leaders of this nation express concern for Dr. Ford and her well-being and esteem for what she has been through. And we can argue about the dysfunction and the wrongs of the event. And we can be upset and we, we should be upset. But in the horror of the story of abuse and in the victim's harm and, and the presence, there is evidence of God's call to well-being ringing out. And how and when and whether that call is properly followed is something we all need to pray about. And ourselves work to fan in the spiritual flames that turn to action to bring about well-being. And we need to pray for all the victims of that type of abuse that Dr. Ford suffered. And our culture has not done nearly enough to stop. So our nation needs needs prayers to God help us in violence toward women. And in our lesson, God's call to well-being, thankfully, was finally acted on. And may it be so with us now, today. May we all remember Esther. And may we all emulate her by fanning the spark of God within to a bright light in whatever situation we find ourselves in, individually and collectively. And may God help us today, help us in our country, to learn how to end violence and oppression against those we consider others most, especially may we address it in violence against women and the tolerance of such violence and the lack of a safe place 